happy Friday. Welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm Dr. Rita Louise, and we're here to provide you with some more excellent, excellent programming. So today, we're going to be talking about what happens on the other side. Is there life after death? Are we more than just a, a physical body, or is there something else that's going on out there that maybe we're not aware of. And to do that, a good friend of Just Energy Radio, Jay Wiedner, is coming on to talk about his new movie, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about Jay, and we'll get him on the air. Jay is an author, filmmaker, and hermetic scholar. He is the producer of the feature documentary film 2012, The Odyssey, and its forthcoming sequel, Time Wave 2013. He is the author of The Mysteries of the Great Cross of Hendaya, I can never say that word, um, Alchemy in the End of Time, and A Monument to the End of Time, um, and that was with Vincent Bridges, as well as contributing writer for the book The Mystery of 2012. Jay has featured on the History Channel documentary The Lost Book of Nostradamus. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, uh, Jay Wiedner. Hey Jay, how's it going? It's going great. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for coming on the show again. I had so much fun with you the last time talking about 2012, which we might talk about again. I don't know. It could happen. Um, but another another new film. You guys are just busy, busy, busy putting out, you know, interesting and informative material for people. Yeah, that's uh, that's our mission statement. We're trying to uh, put out uh, things that no one else will. Uh, Will produce and uh, and put it out in a high quality manner so that uh, uh, people like us have something to watch too, you know. Uh, yeah, I hear that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you you don't watch like Seinfeld and well, I guess that's not on no. the air anymore. I mean, I don't even watch half of that stuff if it's not Discovery Channel or History Channel and you know some pyramid thing or something. Um, it's not on TV. Yeah, or the TV's I, I, don't, not I don't really watch. I don't watch too much TV anymore because it's just the same old, same old. But I love to watch DVDs and movies and things. And so I, uh, I uh, decided that uh, you know we're at ten year anniversary right now that we're going to make. Uh, you know, maybe it's just a small audience of who knows uh, how many people there are in in the in the market. But we just rather sell high quality product to a smaller market. Uh, than a low quality product to a larger market. It's just how it is. But that's great. So yeah. your your new film, Infinity. Um, well, it's Infinity: The Ultimate Trip. I love the title. In a nutshell, what's it about? I mean, because obviously we're going to explore it much deeper. But what is Infinity, and what does that have to do with a trip? Well, I think that. Um, Basically, what happened was was um, uh, my mother died, and uh, in 2002, late 2002, and I, you know, I thought I was a, a fairly, you know, metaphysical person, and that I could, you know, help her through her transition, and uh, I couldn't. Uh, no matter what I told her, no matter how logical I sounded, uh, there was no way to get around the fact that she was scared to death. And um, literally, and uh, she did everything she could to keep herself alive, which actually I believe shortened her life. And uh, the doctors are just a bunch of idiots, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, they killed her early, I believe, with chemo. And um, and so I uh, decided I was talking to Alberto Violdo, who is a good friend of mine, and we were having dinner maybe a year later or something. And I was telling him about all my my problems with my mother dying and he'd had similar problems when his brother had died and so we said why don't we make a film that shows people an alternative view of what happens when we die as opposed to what we get in this world in our western society which is fear and and judgment and all these terrible things and let's go interview people who've had near-death experiences let's compare notes let's get some experts like brian weiss who's the head of the Psychiatric division at uh, Miami University Hospital, and we'll get who also believes and teaches uh, uh, afterlife uh, practices with his patients. We'll get the the experts, and we'll see uh, if we can make a film which actually makes people not afraid of death, or at least tries to make them not afraid. And so that was the purpose of the film, and we, you know, we showed it to a lot of uh, people who were in hospices and 
and people who were older. And uh, the uh, focus groups came back just overwhelmingly positive that people, you know, really liked the, liked the film and they want to show it to their to their family members and to people who are approaching death themselves. And um, and I guess that's the best uh, reviews I could get. You know, were are people who were on the edge of death and who watch it and said it made them feel better and uh, made them feel uh, more courageous, which is also another reason why I wanted to personally make the film was because one of the things that kind of irritates me about what I see in America and in the world today is a lot of uh, uh, unneeded fear is everywhere. And um, I don't see how it does anyone any good to be so afraid of everything that moves. And so I wanted to show, since all fear is basically based on this idea that we're living a finite life and that we live in a finite world, I kind of wanted to show that that's not true. We live in an infinite world with infinite possibilities, and there's no reason to be afraid of anything. And I think that if we finally get to the stage where we're not afraid of anything, then real, true change in this world can start. But I don't think it's going to start if we're all in a complete panic state worrying about every little tiny thing that comes along. Everything is a terrorist act. Every single storm is a sign that the end of the world is at hand. Every show on TV is about the end of the world. Everything is about the end of the world. It's like, oh, my God, we're all going to be so disappointed when the world doesn't end and we still have to be here trudging through life, you know. <laughs> and believe me, it's not going to end. <laughs> it's not that easy. As, but... Uh, but if it does, you won't be scared to make that transition because they watched your movie. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's like, um, uh, it's like, uh, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting his name. He's in the movie. He's a professor. His, his daughter is a big actress. I'm forgetting her name, too. Um, oh, do, 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 do. Who's the famous actress whose dad is in our movie? Um, anyway. uh, Robert Thurman? Thurman, yes, yes. Uh, well, I'm sitting here Thurman's with the, the, the video here yeah. going. With Uma Thurman's father, Robert Thurman, who's a great Buddhist scholar, you know, he says in the movie, there's no way that you're getting out of here dead. It's not that easy. You don't get to come to this world, screw everything up, and then die and get out of it. It's just not going to happen that way. You know, and there's karma, and there's all sorts of things that happen, and... Uh, it's you know it's a larger world and we're not really facing it in the West and it's one of the things I want to do which is break open the whole paradigm of of death and and life and and fear and love and let's just you know really really get it going here and let's do it now and because time is running out for this particular age as you already know with the 2012 stuff. And, you know, hallelujah, <laughs> this age is finally coming to an end. Now what world are we going to make? You know, that's really my concern now is no longer um, arguing with people about whether this age, this particular time period is coming to an end. I already know it is, and people who are sensitive to these things already know it is. So then what, the, what is the next question? And the next question is, okay, what kind of world do we want to make on the other side? And Infinity was really my first salvo into um, uh, getting a, uh, a discussion going about what kind of world we want when we get to the other side. Cool. Uh, one of the things that I was, like, thrilled with is you had, like, mega good people in this movie and I'm just going to kind of put this out there so in the movie you had Neil Donald Walsh Daniel Brinkley who we'll talk about him uh, <laughs> Greg Brandon Alberto Villado however you say his name John Brilliant. Holland Brian Weiss uh, some other people's names who I don't, can't pronounce and then Renette Dollinger Renate Dollinger was she the artist lady yes yeah, she was great. She was so cute. She was so cute. <laughs> but, I mean, just the collection of people that you got to talk about these things. Oh, I have a question, because you said pe these people had near-death experiences. Did Neil Donald Walsh have a near-death experience? It wasn't clear whether that was his experiences that he shared in the movie were a right. meditative experience 
or near-death experience because they were very similar. Well, they were, and it's a great question. And I tried to, I tried to show that it's possible to. Um, in the movie, we have the Buddhist scholar Dugson Ponlop, and he he shows that even when you're going to sleep, you're kind of going into a. Uh, you're going into a um, kind of a near-death experience, even by going to sleep at night, and you can actually use it to practice near-death. And I think that that's what Neil experienced was a near-death experience uh, via being upset by having a fight with his wife and then going to sleep. And um, it, it, they do it in the Tibetan practices. They actually do... Um, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, kind of uh, sleeping practices to get ready for death. So, um, in a way, that's what it is too. You know, when you go to sleep, you you you, you knock yourself out, and then you wake up, and uh, you know it's another day. And sort of uh, life and death is very similar to that, uh, in which you know we die and we wake up in possibly another dimension or back here. And so I think that's what he was doing. It was a, it was a, a, a it was a, a, a near death experience brought on by tension, uh, you know, suddenly putting someone into a sleepy state in which the world becomes, the real world becomes obvious, which is of course what dreams are. Um, a lot of dreams, not all dreams, but a lot of dreams are, are, uh, really about, uh, about this uh, voyage to another universe, another world, in which which is like maybe parallel to ours. So you have things in dreams which are similar to what's going on in your life, but there's odd peculiarities which are impossible, like anti-gravity and being able to fly and all these other things. And so dreams are really a combination of of a, a fifth dimensional matrix intermixed with our 3D, 4D matrix, which is the world that we live in. Humans are really kind of caught in between the third and the fourth dimension. Our feet are on the ground in the third dimension, but our head is in the sky in the fourth dimension, bringing down ideas and perceptions and things, which I don't think we probably share with the animal world, um, except for possibly dolphins and, and some dogs and some higher intelligent animals. But um, that's that's what this is about. So what happens when you escape? Well, you know, we have the Hindus tell us that we are tethered to a higher dimension via a small channel which runs down from this higher dimension into our pineal gland. This channel is called the Shashumna, and this Shashumna is like one four thousandth the width of a human hair. And that's the tunnel that we go through when we die or when we dream. And what happens when you die is, and this is going to be in the sequel to Infinity, is the third dimensional matrix, begin, uh, which is also mixed with the fourth dimensional matrix, begins to fold in on itself. And it folds in and then it collapses into the Shashumna, or this tiny tunnel. And your life essence moves up this Shashumna back into the higher matrix. And this is what people see when they see this tunnel of light, which, you know, even like Hieronymus Bosch and, uh, did a painting of it 300 years ago. It's many people have reported this tunnel, not just in the movie Infinity, but many people throughout life, including a CBS reporter who'd had a near death experience a couple of years ago after he was hit by a, by an IDE bomb uh, in Iraq. Uh, so um, these things are well known. Uh, even Plato tells a story of a, of a Greek soldier who got uh, killed in battle, for died for a half hour, and uh, went up this tunnel and met his family and the angels. And these are these stories are replete through history. It's not uh, some fantasy. Uh, um, another study, which is very interesting, um, was done by a scientist whose name escapes me at the moment, but he interviewed little children who had not had a chance to be influenced by um, stories like this. They were too young 
when they had their near-death experiences, and by God, they had the same exact um, experiences as older people had, i.e., um, feeling like their body was collapsing in on itself, rolling up through the Shishumna and heading towards um, the infinite. And I think that's uh, it's a, it's a it's a continuous story heard everywhere, and um, and I think at a certain point, you know, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a duck. And uh, so there is no death. There is, uh, but you are going to have to go through a life review. And I think that a lot of people find that aspect of that of this whole experience a little unsettling, because the okay. So Jay, are, let yes. me let me interrupt you here for a second. We'll we'll come back to life review because we definitely need to talk about that because that I think is fascinating. I want to talk about the tunnel a second because sure. one of the things that I believe is that okay. So the there's our energy bodies, you know, the etheric body, the mental body, the causal body, blah, 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 and they're connected to each other via the chakras. And I believe that the chakras actually sit in the body and then the nadis, the channels that connect them to each other, are kind of like these little wormhole things. They and are. couldn't this tunnel be like a wormhole that's actually taking us from the physical dimension into a different energy, you know, we're just collapsing in because we no, le no longer need to be trapped here in the physical plane anymore. Uh, well, I think that's exactly right. I think we're, um, uh, we, we um, basically what it is, it's like a spark between two wires. And this shishumna is like a wire that, it's not a wire really, but I mean, just using this metaphorically, that comes down probably attracted to the earth by gravity and when it gets close to the um, close to the surface of the earth there's a spark between the shishumna and the surface of the earth as it grounds itself that spark is us that's living people trees animals these are these little sparks that exist and they're effervescent uh, they're um, uh, 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 ephemeral uh, they don't last long, they're here, they burn bright, and they go out quick. And that's what life is. And when that spark burns out, it doesn't really burn out. It just, it just collapses back into the wire or the shashumna, which begins to pull off from the surface and reimmerse the self back into the universal matrix and whatever that is. And, uh, uh, so yeah, I think you're exactly right. This tunnel is is a very viable link between inter between dimensions, and um, I think uh, I think it's very very interesting actually, and um, and how the Hindus and the Buddhists and even the Egyptians all kind of have the same point of view on this whole thing. I think at a certain point, you know, you just can't argue with it. Uh, um, okay, know. so we just got a question in the chat room that directly ties to this. It's from Yogi Billy, and he says, How might string theory play with the energy flow in the Nadi Chakra and between planes? Ah, you know. well. Uh, <laughs> is this a plant? Do you know Yogi Billy? No, <laughs> no I don't. Uh, maybe I do. I don't know. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, that's really good because string theory is sort of this same thing. So we have to realize that this matrix is a um, is a torus, like a donut, and it, uh, it it revolves in and out of itself. It folds down into itself, uh, collapses down into a spiral in the middle of it, and then as it comes out the south pole, it begins expanding again, going around the outside sphere like a donut, coming up to the north pole, and there it begins collapsing down. And that little center point of this donut, at the very center, is this vortice. And that vortice is three-dimensional life. The outer donut is the fourth-dimensional world, time and space. But the, but the very center is where, where everything is collapsed and where gravity is at its highest. That is where physical matter uh, begins and ends. So when you look at a tree you can see that the central vortice of this donut-shaped torus 
runs right down the trunk of the tree. It runs right down the center of our spine. The difference between humans and other animals is that we have been gifted with a spine that sits completely vertical. And so it can attenuate with the outer matrix in a way that no other animal can really do. And so this is why you have to stand up straight, why in yoga you're taught to keep your spine straight, why you do Tai Chi or Qi Gong or any of these things are all there to teach you how to keep your spine straight so that you can attenuate with the um, Shashumna flow from the outer matrix. This is where creativity comes from. This is where thoughts come from, where art comes from, where religion comes from, where science comes from, where everything comes from is this downflow from this outer matrix into 3D matter, which sits at the center of the torus. Now, when you pass out of this world, you're really not really passing out of the universe. You're merely passing out of a phase within the torus you're moving from 3D to 4D to possibly 5D, 60, and 70 uh, worlds in which the body doesn't matter, but consciousness is everything. So, so what is this place? You know, and, and the answer is the, that this place is where higher dimensional frequencies can slow down long enough to actually begin to make conscious, cohesive sense of the universe so that when we're thrust back into higher levels, higher dimensions, we will know what is going on more for having descended down into 3D. And this is what the Hindus teach. They say that you can escape this world once you understand this world. But And this is what the Gnostics taught in, in Europe and in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, that only through gnosis, only through knowledge, of this world can you escape this world now, I'm not saying that you want to escape the world I'm saying what you because that's not the point the point is to stay here long enough to learn everything about this world and then escape will just naturally occur because you know everything about this world and you don't need to come back here anymore but there are a multitude and infinite amount of worlds and this is just one of them and uh, and that should give us, you know, great pause here, uh, optimistic pause, because that's a that's a wonderful thing to know that there is a multitude of multiverses and that we are all part of it, and we're kind of graduating and moving slowly up the ladder towards reunification with with the one. I, I believe at the final end, but that's 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 a long time from now. It's not going to happen quick. There's no quick fixes. And there's no way you're getting out of here dead. So um, you need to um, <laughs> take a deep breath and, and learn to love it. <laughs> but, I mean, I would say that the majority of people on the planet, or in the United States, I'll even, like, make it a smaller group, aren't even aware. I mean, there's just the basic assumption that, you know, you die, your body goes in a box, and you go to heaven, and that's the end of the game. You know, there's yep. not any kind of reincarnation or any responsibility. I mean, you know, I was brought up Catholic, you know, three seconds before you die, the priest comes, you tell them a couple of sins, they say, okay, say Hail Mary, and then, and you go to heaven, you yeah. know, <laughs> no big free deal. Pass. Yeah, it's a free pass. I was raised But it's, it's not sounding, but it's not sounding uh, like that's the reality of the reality that you're sharing. No, um, you know the Catholics have uh, have a certain take, which is which is not altogether wrong. I mean, you know, I was I've been given last rites. Almost died once. Had a priest give me last rites, and I was fully assured in my twelve year old body that you know I was headed straight to Jesus and everything was fine. And I guess there was a level of comfort in that. Although to be frank with you, it scared the living hell out of me um, as a twelve year old being given last rites. And um, uh, so I, I, I think, you know, the, the problem with the Catholics is that they uh, threw the baby out with the bathwater and they got rid of reincarnation, you know, about 400 A.D. with the, uh, the Council of Nicaea. 
and uh, it was a part of Christian doctrine all the way up until Constantine threw it out. And and Constantine, frankly, he threw it out because the doctrine of reincarnation states that you've got to pay for everything that you did while you were alive uh, through karma. And he had done so many terrible things that he didn't want to come back. <laughs> Because he was so afraid that, so he threw the whole doctrine out, and with that doctrine being thrown out, um, in, you know, in, 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 at that time, all those years ago, what they did was that they retarded us spiritually, and that's what we are right now. We're we're spiritually retarded because we think we're only here once. We can grab everything we want to grab now. We don't have to worry about any consequences for anything that we do. Um, and if you're a Christian, well, you get you get. Or all you have to do is believe in Jesus. You get a free get out of jail card, and um, and none of that is true. I'm I'm sorry. It is none of that is true. It doesn't it doesn't fit with any kind of of fairness or spiritual logic or anything. And it has caused the problems in the world that we have today where no one cares about the future, everyone's just damaging themselves, their loved ones, the planet, and uh, it's, it's, just, it's like a monster running ra- a ramshackle all over the landscape, busting the place up and, uh, uh, because we've become so disconnected. And, and then, of course, at the end of this thing is death, the finality of death in which you're never going to, you're not going to be able to take your money with you, you're not going to be able to take your memories with you, you're not going to be able to take anything with you. And this is an incredibly cynical attitude which has permeated the entire Western culture and which is now threatening to spread outwards. And um, it has to be stopped because it is, it is not just threatening spiritually, it's now beginning to threaten us physically with the uh, destruction of the environment and uh, the overwhelming greed uh, uh, some people have in which, you know, you just got to have to ask the question, you know, when is enough enough? You know, when, when is a, a 800 billion like enough money for one person to have? And, and what did they yeah. do to get that money? And, and these are, these are questions which, well, we'll ask later. Yeah, yeah. Well, and actually, why don't we come back? Somebody asked in the chat room, is there such a thing as collective karma? And is it generational or ethnic? I think it's a great question. It ties in with what we're talking about. So we'll come back to that after the break. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. We're talking to Jay Wiesner about his new movie, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip. And we'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. sensitive to energy? Want to explore the world beyond the five senses? Looking for a new career as an alternative health care practitioner? Then the Institute of Applied Energetics, Medical Intuition, and Energy Medicine Training programs may be right for you. Our comprehensive curriculum provides students with a deep understanding of how to detect, evaluate, and transform the subtle body as well as techniques for correcting energetic imbalances that may underscore a person's ability to experience radiant health. So if you are sensitive to energy, contact the Institute of Applied Energetics right away. Be a catalyst for changing the way healthcare is done around the world. Visit www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com and start your new career today. How would you like to live long and enjoy great health? How about creating solid bones and whiter teeth, strengthen your heart and eyes, and have radiant, youthful-looking skin? There is an ancient health and longevity secret that has been used for millennia in Egypt, India, and China that can help you achieve this. For the first time in the modern world, Pearlseum brings ancient wellness secrets to you. For more information about Pearlseum, visit www.ancientpearl.com. 
Before we get back to the show, I want to thank all of you for tuning in to Just Energy Radio this evening. Many of the people I've helped over the years were listeners just like you. If you're at a junction in your life, don't stand alone at this important time. Call me or send me an email. We can set up a private consultation so that you too can experience wholeness in your life. To find out more about the services I offer, visit soulhealer.com. And now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm Dr. Rita, Lu- Rita Louise. I do know my name. Um, and we're talking to Jay Weavner about his new movie, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip. And if you want more information about the movie um, and his other movies, uh, go to www.sacredmysteries.com. So before the break, we were talking about like what we're doing to ourselves and the karma that we're potentially incurring. And there was a question in the chat room about the concept of collective karma. And then there was a second part, is it generational or ethnic? And uh, what do you think? I mean, are we, you know, because I think everybody is familiar with the concept of individual karma. You know, well, all right, not everybody. I am, you are. My listeners, I'm sure, are. You know, and so there's that aspect, but can we create karma on a collective level? That's, I've never even thought about that. Um, well, I think that's probably, yeah, I think it's true. You can, and I think you can also shed karma on a, uh, on a collective level. And I think that, uh, you know, we're headed towards a, you know, if you don't stand up, uh, when you see something going wrong, um, your karma is affected. And if you don't say something when the powers that be uh, tell you to do something because you're afraid of something or you're afraid you're going to die or you're afraid of something, well, you're now as responsible as they are for it. So uh, you, this is something that we have to think about. This is one of the reasons why... I'm trying to get people not to be afraid because if we decide to attack a country and a great many of the people that are in the country do not stand up against us, then you are now part of the the evil that designated the war. And um, we need to uh, say, no, uh, we're not doing that anymore. We're not going to allow ourselves to be part of a culture that uh, that does these things and we're going to we have to reject them and we have to reject the culture and it's not just their policies it's it's their food it's it's the way it's their television shows it's it's everything that they're doing that we find repugnant and if you you know if you get along go along to get along or get along to go along well, you know, it's not that easy. You know, your, your karma is still affected. And so we need to, as I like to say, create parallel, a parallel culture to the one that we're living in right now. And, it, you know, it, it, and by example, um, we will change the world. But if you're trying to get Joe Sixpack to change on his own by talking to him or anything, that's not going to work. Joe Sixpack only wants to see results. And um, so we need to create a parallel society, a parallel culture with shows like this and, and movies like Sacred Mysteries are putting out in which we present a positive view and also a rejection of the negative aspects of the culture we were living in. And this is what 2012 is really about. It's about, about us collectively deciding what kind of world we're going to be living in. And right now we're not making real good decisions here. You know, we're getting a war. We're not Nobel making decisions. Jay, we're not making decisions. It's, you know, I was listening to the news right after the election and, you know, there was all this commentary of, 
well, you elected these people into office, and you know, if you want, if you don't like what they're doing, elect other people into office. And so, okay, so that all happened. Different people got elected into office, and they're still doing the same thing <laughs> that the old people did. So nothing really changed. It just has new faces. Yeah. And I think people, in the general sense, don't know how to facilitate that. Don't know how to make those changes because what they're taught is. You go and elect a new representative. You go and do this thing because I think people are feel like they're not being heard. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. you talk about health care, and it's like they're not being heard. So, oh. you know, it, it's well, they're not, and frustrating. I think it, well, it is, and I think that that's the mistake we're making. We 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 have what I call in the West. We have this tremendous Messiah complex where we're just sitting around waiting for the Messiah to come. And it might be Jesus, or it might be the aliens, or it might be Obama, or it might be Sarah Palin. Who knows? But everybody's thinking that, the, that there's going to be somebody coming to save them. And there isn't anyone coming to save us. No one, no nothing is going to save us. We have to save ourselves. We have to get out of this psychological um, trap that we've been put in, where something from without will magically come like John Wayne at the end of the movie and save everybody. And it just, it isn't going to happen. And, and very bright people keep getting caught up in this thing. And I saw it with Obama, and I said, you know, Obama can't change this world. You know, he, he's a great symbol for change, but he's, as soon as he get, gets into office, he's going to be caught up in the same psychological traps that everybody else has been caught up in in, in, in in politics. And we just have to simply say, guess what? We're not even going to vote for anyone that you put up because we don't believe in anything that you're doing anyway. And, and when we do that, when we have the courage to say no, you know, there's a great scene in the movie Gandhi where um, Trevor Howard, I think is his name, great British actor, He's the general of the British forces, and, and he's all dressed up in his uniform, you know, with his, with his uh, riding crop and his hat and his medals. And he walks up to Ben Kingsley, who's meditating on the floor, you know, Gandhi, and he says, Well, you just don't expect us to walk out of India, do you? And Gandhi looks up and goes, Oh, hell no, no, you, you could take a, you could take a, a carriage or, or a boat. Um, there's many ways to, to, to leave India, uh, and uh, uh, you know that's how we have to be. It's like, you know, you don't expect us to just do this, do you? Well, yeah, actually, we do. <laughs> we do expect you to start following the things that we want instead of just following what you want. And we're trapped in this thing. We're so afraid we're going to lose everything, including our lives. That we're uh, and and instead of doing anything, we've conveniently fallen into a system of the Messiah complex where the Messiah is going to come, he's going to save us all, and we don't have to do one damn thing. And it's just not true. I'm not saying that there isn't, you know, avatars, and I'm not saying anything about Jesus or, any, or even aliens or Obama. I'm talking about the psychological attitude which freezes us in the moment, thinking that something is going to happen when it isn't. And I think we've been fooled enough. I mean, haven't we? We've been waiting and waiting for anything. I think Obama put the, put the knife into the Messiah complex in a lot of ways because a lot of people are now realizing that, you know, even though he had a good message and even though he uh, had the oratory skills, he too is caught in the trap and he can't get out of it. And he knows it. And we know that he knows it now. And now he can get the same week that he gets the um, Nobel Peace Prize, he uh, uh, escalates the war in Afghanistan by 40,000 troops. And there isn't anyone like with their jaw agape going, what in the world is going on here? And, uh, and, and Obama's caught in that dilemma between what he said and what he probably believes and the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is that he's going to get in big trouble if he doesn't escalate with the military. Well, you know what he should do? He should just pull out. He should just pull out of both wars and see what happens. Um, uh, begin creating the parallel universe right now, but he can't 
and it doesn't come from above anyway. It comes from below, and it's going to be up to us. And it's my number one. So my number one goal at this point in time is to uh, try to get everyone to realize that that it's up to them and that you guys need to start taking care of yourselves and your family. You need to start thinking about the – Terrence McKenna used to say that – and it confounded me when he said it. It took me 15 years to figure out what he meant. But he used to say all the time that we must live as if the apocalypse has already occurred. And I thought, What? What does that mean? But now I get it. It's like in order to show the world how to live rightly, we need to start living as if that world has already ended and that our world has begun. And when we do that, when we do that single act of living in the, in the world that's coming and rejecting the world that is right now, they will follow us. We will be the leaders. And um, I don't think we're that far from this. I think there's a radical break going on um, everywhere, on, in all places, all at once. It's a, uh, it's almost like a spiritual renaissance, which is going to give us courage and strength to move beyond the failed world of the past and create the world that we want. And all the children of the '60s, like me, you know, this is what we've been dreaming about for years. So we should just uh, embrace this. And another thing I want to say is people who are my age or older who went through the 60s and somehow survived um, we have to become the elders that we never had and the young kids are really looking for something some kind of wisdom out of us and I'm afraid we're not really doing a very good job of helping them and so I'm kind of calling forth on everyone who is, you know, above 50, uh, who went through the world and has come out of it uh, somewhat enlightened, uh, to maybe you should start helping out those people in your area that are in their 20s that are really looking for some wisdom, spiritual wisdom, and also physical wisdom as to how they're going to get through the transition, which is about to happen. And so, you know, I'd like to talk about that transition at some point where well, what is going to happen here and, and what is it that we should be getting ready for because it's vitally important that everyone knows what's about to occur. Well, just handle it. You're on roll. <laughs> well, um, the, you know, you I mean, because to, yeah. I think that that's really an important piece of information because, you know, the clock is just ticking and... Yeah. I mean, in my perspective, you know, the part of the transformation, part of the consciousness raising that is happening is this increase in polarity between, I gave a presentation the other day, and I, I said, you know, between the, you know, everyone and the bad people. Yeah. And I used that word, the bad yeah. people. Yeah, and I had people. somebody take issue, and so I had somebody take issue with me saying the bad people, and I'm like, well, yeah. excuse me, but there are bad people. There are. But anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, you know, I don't know. I'm past that. You know, I'm judgmental. I'm judging, and you know, it's it's it, there is a time when you need to make intelligence is judgment. Okay, I mean, um, I you know this this I this namby pamby new age thing where you don't pass judgment is crap. You're passing judgment every moment. You're passing judgment on how good the air is that you're breathing, how good the food is you're eating, how warm you are, how cold you are, how much you like the person you're in the room with. You're constantly making judgments and, uh, uh, in, and, and, and intellectually, you, you know, you, we rely on judgments for the quality of our life. So to say that you're, to, to say that being judgmental is wrong is not true at all. Everyone is always being judgmental. Even saying that being judgmental is wrong is being judgmental. So, But you know, skip it, the judgmental part. Skip the judgmental yeah. part. It's like, I'm sorry, but if somebody ripped you off and I'm just making up an example for $20,000 and then you turn around and go, oh, but they're good. They're just misguided. No. I'm sorry. I don't know anybody <laughs> on this planet that would say that. And in my mind, whoever that person is for you or whatever that is, they're the bad people. It's not a judgment thing. I mean, in my mind, I'm sorry. It's not a judgment I'm thing. I, I, I think we need to start calling people out on these things and not be, and to be cur courageous about it. When somebody screws up, we need to say, listen, that's a major screw-up, and we don't like it. 
and, 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 and you know, to, to sit around and think that there are not bad people. There are bad people. There are psychopaths. There are people who will lie and cheat and steal without one ounce of guilt. And, and to say that there aren't is extremely naive. So the first thing you need to do is not be naive about people. You need to say, okay, there's good people, there are bad people, and I had better put on my antenna so that I can tell as best as I can who is who. Some people are psychic. My wife is psychic, and she almost knows immediately when somebody's not up to snuff or not. I have a little bit of trouble because I guess I'm just raised Catholic and was taught that everybody's good, and then I had to find out that actually everyone isn't good. And... Um, and actually, the nuns and the priests were at the top of the list for those who weren't good, actually, now that I think about it. And um, so I think that, you know, we have to decide, you know, that there are bad people. There are people who are going to rip us off. There's people who are going to steal from us. There are people who may even kill us. So we have to understand that, that they, there are people who do not care. And when this thing snaps, which it is coming, the snap is coming, when that happens, those people are going to become not only glaringly obvious, but they're going to get very aggressive as their mm, opportunities for swindle um, disappear. Because as the economy disappears, the opportunity for swindling uh, uh, disappears because there's no money to swindle. And so the uh, criminal class will get very, very desperate as this thing unfolds. And so what is happening? Well, we have a, we have a two-stage thing happening here. We have an incredible physical process happening, an economic, uh, environmental process that's going on, and then we have this spiritual thing that's going on. And so people should be taking both of those into consideration. The physical part is, how am I going to live? How am I going to eat? How, what am I going to make? How am I going to make money? What skills are going to be useful in the coming world? And then, of course, the spiritual problem, which is, you know, what what kind of spiritual world are we going to be living in? What kind of spiritual teachings do we want to pass down to our children and to our grandchildren? And um, I, and I think that we're in the small window now where a lot of spiritual teachings are rising up to the top because of the internet and, and, and because of, of, the, of the amazing amounts of information that are, are, are coming out right now. And I think we need to gather up those things and take them with us into the new world um, because I'm not, I'm not making any bets that the internet is going to be around. I, I don't know. It may be, but I don't know. And so we have to assume the worst, and that is that there's not going to be an internet and that we may need to take some of this stuff into book form, um, libraries, local libraries are going to become very useful, I think, in the future. But also, you know, how to grow food, how to take care of community, how to take care of children, how to educate, um, uh, doctoral skills like healing and uh, nursing. These are all going to be what's really important in the future. Um, my so, nephew. So let me ask you. Let me ask you a question because I, I yep. think we kind of missed a basic point. So yeah. it's sounding like your vision of where we're going to be going is that because of our own misuse, you know, lack of concern, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to create an environment where, you know, there's potentially like no electricity. There's, you know, um, you know, there was that TV show Dark Angel which yep. is not my book, Dark Angels, which is a great book. People should buy it. But anyway, um, you know, and they had like some EMP pulse and, you know, it, it didn't take them back into the Stone Age, but it kind of set everybody back and life was just totally different. Yeah, um, I, I, th I think you need to read The Long Emergency by James Kunstler. It's a great book about what's about to happen. Um, he's a, uh, a journalist with Rolling Stone and... And a friend of mine, and he's really looked at this, and he has taken each thing that's occurring and extrapolated it forward to show where we're going to be living. And it's you know it's going to be quite a shock uh, what's about to happen. But I think at the same time, it's actually a much better world that we're headed towards. And um, because the stress of 
the modern world is is so much and so deep that I don't even think we know how stressed out we are anymore. And it's just the idea of you know, uh, families breaking up because corporations demand that people move all over the place. So you have families that are scattered. That's going to end. Your the the idea that you're going to get apples from New Zealand and potatoes from South America. That's that's going to end. Everything's going to become fairly localized. Uh, travel is going to become pretty much non-existent uh, because of the energy diet that we're going to be on. And uh, so these things are all headed our way, and we have a choice, you know, do we accept it and, and try to work with it and make a better world, or do we cry and bitch because, oh, it's so horrible that I'm not going to have an Internet and, uh, and uh, as much uh, electricity and hot water as I want. And I think you're going to uh, see a lot of people get very unhappy when this thing comes down on them. And I don't think we're all that far away from it. And I think Obama, by the way, knows all this. Um, if you read his interviews, he's pretty much saying that there's going to be this shift and, and uh, you know, that, that, that this current thing is not sustainable. Um, he doesn't know how to get there. I don't either. I have a feeling that it's not going to matter because it's just going to collapse in on us anyway. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you need to do. You need to... You need to start looking at where you're living. You need to start looking at where you get your food from. You need to start looking at where you get your water from. Uh, you need to form alliances in your communities. Um, you know, there are a lot of communities on the West Coast which are getting ready for this. Uh, the one I live in is getting ready for it. Um, all the way up to the mayor and the, and the city council planning it. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, some people are preparing for it and some people aren't, and those who aren't are going to be in a very, very, very serious trouble when this occurs. And I don't know when it's going to occur. could be, you know, as far away as 2016, 2018. Um, I don't know. Um, there's another great book, which I highly recommend, called The Fourth Turning by Strauss and Howe, and that's about um, about this thing that's about to happen also, the United States goes through a revolutionary period every 85 years. You know, we went in the revolution, and 85 years later was a civil war. 85 years later was a Great Depression, and we're 85 years later. And they predicted in the 90s that this, that the economy was going to collapse. There was possibly going to be a civil war. Um, all sorts of things that are now looking very, very likely. So we need to be realistic, face up to what is going on, take uh, measures to protect ourselves and our families, and that's the physical part. And then the second part is I really think it's important to adopt a spiritual discipline of some kind to keep you calm in the middle of the maelstrom, which is uh, swirling around us even as we speak. You know, so I, I, I think you should, you know, Find a yoga class or qigong or tai chi or walking in the forest or whatever it is, you know, that, that, that you need to do and do it every day and do it with a, with a certain discipline and a certain kind of love for it. I think those are the things that we need to do and we need to start now. It's not coming. It's here. I hear that. I mean, yeah. I sit there and think about all the young people, you know, and I'm going to say the 30 and under group that you know never had a tv without a remote control they were brought up on you know play yep. playstation and uh xbox and don't know i mean when we were when i was a kid we had a garden in our backyard you know and so not that i'm a great you know farmer but at least i have a clue <laughs> of what you maybe do um and i i don't think from you know your perspective, the kind of things that we need to do that young people are remotely prepared they to aren't. do any of these things. Well, they're not, and it really worries me. And I, I spend a lot of time um, talking to young people, and I'm even trying to create a uh, uh, an event called Future Shift: How to Survive and Thrive in the 21st Century, which will be a video and a website and, and a um, 
conferences for young people so that we can pull them out of the desperate situation that they're in where they're trapped in this kind of false reality and the real world they're really the first generation honestly that doesn't know how to feed themselves um, you know, our generation they don't know how to cook. cook they don't even no, know how to they, cook they don't know anything and and uh, it's 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 a perfect excuse me it's a perfect storm i mean they're just they're setting themselves up for a fall and um, and uh, the ones you know nature's great though because Nature cleans out those who are not um, prepared. And so the young people who are prepared, and there are a lot, believe me, who are preparing themselves, they're going to survive and thrive. And those others who are just playing on uh, the, uh, the, the uh, PlayStations and stuff, they're, they're not going to make it. And uh, the, the, by the time they wake up and realize they're not going to make it, it's going to be too late. When you add in rising obesity rates and um, the fact that that they can do tests of the New York water supply and it's filled with Prozac and 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 all sorts of uh, uh, antidepressants, uh, you can see that when this thing hits, 90% of the people are going to be completely unprepared for it. And that may be, by the way, a plan. I don't know. Um, it seems to me what, that they end up getting taken off all their meds, and so now you have a bunch of cranky, strung out people. <laughs> Believe me, you think that's not going to mm. happen? <laughs> it is going to happen, and, and 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 we're not even talking about the people who. What's going to happen to the people when the welfare checks and the unemployment checks and the uh, food stamps suddenly stop? When you add that to the to the meds. Um, you got, and the amount of guns that are in this country, you got, you got a, uh, you got a stew that, uh, that is going to boil over, and we have to be prepared for that. And I say, oh, he's being so pessimistic. I'm not being pessimistic. If, if I, if you drove, if I was hiking down the road and you drove by and I said, listen, another two miles down the road, the bridge is out. Be really careful because you'll fall off the cliff. Am I being pessimistic? Or am I telling you something that you need to know? And so I reject this idea that I'm being a pessimist by, by saying something that is grounded in reality. And uh, I don't think it's being pessimistic at all. I think it's being actually prepared and in a way optimistic because I think you're going to survive it. Well, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, you know, we had talked real early about the life review process. So let's talk about those people kind of get back on affinity a little bit about the life review process for the people that don't make it because maybe they'll change their ways now so that they can have a better life. So I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. We're talking to Jay Wiener about his movie, Infinity. Just Energy and we'll be Radio back after your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. Go deep inside yourself and venture into the realm of the unconscious mind with my Meditating on the Kabbalah Guided Imagery Audio CDs. Discover who you are and what you want in life. Meditating on the Kabbalah can help you to open, clear, and revitalize the energetic pathways of your subtle being. They will support you in your spiritual quest by helping you to access the profound insights and inner guidance you need as you work in alignment with your highest good. Let them help you to release negative thoughts and emotions and clear away any limitations that may be keeping you from experiencing your full potential. Walk down the path to health, healing, understanding, and enlightenment with Meditating on the Kabbalah. Order your copy today at www.soulhealer.com. That's right, that's www.soulhealer.com. Balance in all things is critical to maintaining health. In the hectic drive of today's world, many of us forget to take care of our most important asset, ourselves. At ProductForTheSoul.com, we want to support your effort to nurture yourself. We offer a wide variety of herbs, supplements, and high-quality, ready-to-eat, all-natural foods. We even have guilt-free chocolates. 
Best of all, our products are delivered straight to your door. It's time to start loving yourself. Visit productsforthesoul.com and start loving yourself today. You can get a copy of Dr. Rita's latest book, Avoiding the Cosmic 2x4, by visiting www.soulhealer.com. Get your copy today. And now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio and thank you for staying tuned to the show. We're starting the second hour and if you've liked the programming that you've heard so far, please do mark the show as a favorite. I'd really appreciate it. So we're still talking to Jay Wheatner about his new film, Infinity, although we did get off on a 2012 thing and we might go back there. I'm not sure. But um, his website is www.sacredmysteries.com. And so Jay, we were talking before the break about you know, this transition that's going to happen, but there's also the piece where there are people that are going to check out, and we had talked much earlier about the life review process, which I stopped you because I think it's really important to bring that whole concept to the table because I don't think people think about the consequences of their actions. And I, I, so I'm just going to give it to you because I know, all right, I'll just say, that was Daniel Brinkley's thing, and I think he's really funny. <laughs> he's a riot. He calls himself a redneck, and he really is. It's well, he really, is. Yeah, it's really <laughs> to hear a redneck talking like that. It's like, whoa. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, the, the, I think the life review is very interesting, and I think it does scare people. I showed um, Infinity to a wealthy businessman, and... Uh, he got to, he said, oh, I watched about 20 minutes of it. It was really good, but I had to turn it off. And I said, oh, that's interesting because about 20 minutes into it is when we start talking about the life review. And, um, <laughs> and in that section is where we say, or actually Daniel and Alberto and some others say, that you're going, when you die, <clears throat> you're going to live your entire life all over again. But, you're also going to live the life of all the people that you've hurt or helped also. Now, Daniel Brinkley, who had served two terms in Vietnam as a Green Beret, you know, he had a lot of hurt that he had to live through from the people that he hurt when he went through his first life review, okay? And he came back a changed man because he had been such a brutal person that he saw that every he had to live through all the brutality that he had inflicted on everybody else. And believe me, that's enough to scare a lot of people from watching the rest of Infinity because they don't want to think about that. But you know, even if you did bad things in your past, and all of us have done bad things, you know, you're, you're alive now. You have every chance to make up for that. So, yes, you're going to go through a life review, and yes, every person that you hurt and every person you helped, you're going to go through whatever it is that you put that person through. And that could be mighty horrible for some people. But from this moment on, you can also start living your life right and creating all those good things that you're going to live through too. All the, all the people that you are now going to start helping with your life. And I think that's really the answer. The answer is not to be afraid of that which you have done, that which you are going to experience in your life review, but to create the best life review you can starting right now. And um, I don't think there's anything else to do. So go out when you're, you know, when you're at the Safeway, you know, go out a little bit extra to to be nice to the, to the person checking your groceries through and at the waitress at the restaurant. Be a little, take a little bit of time to be a little bit extra nice to her, to give her a, a bigger tip than you normally would because you're cheap and you don't want to be cheap. And, and these are the things that, that you need to start doing right now and not be so afraid of that which you have already done because you're going to go through that. There's nothing that you can do about that. None of us are perfect. 
and all of us are going to go through these bad things. But don't forget, you're also going to go through the good things. And there's a lot of things you did in your life which you don't even know were good. You may have said something or done something to someone, and you went off and they changed their entire life and never told you that it was you that did it. And we don't know, and that's another thing about these past life reviews that you go through when you die. There's a lot of surprises waiting for you, a lot of things that you did that were good and kind that you never knew were having the ramifications that they had. And it's actually in those selfless acts of kindness that um, your karma is truly created. When you did something not because you were trying to get good karma, you just did it because you knew it was the right thing to do. Standing up for people who, uh, through, uh, who suffered injustice, standing up to governments who are sending us off to wars that are wrong, not being afraid to speak up when you see a wrong. Um, these things gather and aggregate a into a very positive life review. And, and remember this, it's the most important thing, which is about courage. And when you are courageous, that makes up for a lot of the bad things that you've done. And so if you've done a lot of bad things, well, you know, the way to get around it now is to be courageous and start doing good things from here on in and uh, go out of your way to, uh, to do it and go out of your way to speak the truth. And go out, even when everyone starts screaming at you because you said something that irritated them, that don't be afraid. Just keep saying it. Uh, you'd be surprised how a little courage can bust up even the most um, string, uh, strong belief systems. Uh, as soon as they see the hypocrisy of their belief system because you pointed it out, um, you know, they may be mad at you in the moment, but you never know. In a year or two, you might have altered their lives completely, and we don't know. We don't know what is doing what. All we know is that we have to keep trying it. Well, you know, and what you're saying makes me think, you know, since it's the holiday season, uh, that movie, the, A Christmas Carol, and the character Scrooge, who was visited yeah. by Marley, who showed him his length of chain that he had been building link by link of all of the bad things that he did throughout his life, but he became a changed man. He, he realized that, you know, he needed to make this change and became a wonderful, caring, and giving man. And so probably, you know, in that life review process, he unknitted that chain of evil that he had created in the former part of his life and cleared up a bunch of his karma. Well, he did, and actually, that's actually a great analogy. I had not really thought about that, but that is what Scrooge goes through. He falls asleep, and, and he goes through a life review. That's, that's great. I had not really thought about that. I'm going to have to see that movie again. And, and he, Every Christmas. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and he goes through his life review and realizes that he can still put things right. There's still a chance. And, and you know, if you did 10,000 bad things and you've only got two years left in your life, well, that, that gives you two years to do 100,000 good things. So you can, you can outbalance it, and you shouldn't be afraid of it. And besides, you've already done it anyway. Um, there's, no, there's no reason to um, be afraid of it. But I don't want you to reject the whole idea because you're afraid that you're going to have to go through the life of some, you know, somebody that you did something terrible to. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. You are going to have to go through that. And believe me, I've done bad things too. And I'm not looking forward to those aspects of my life. But what I'm trying to do now and every day is to make sure that everything that happens from here on in is completely cool so that I can have just the greatest life review I can have and uh, forget those other things. And um, and believe me, it's not so bad. I think probably the most, uh, the worst part of the past life review that we all must go through, I think is probably just pure embarrassment of... Um, of how silly and stupid we all are for most of our lives. And, um, you know, I think that that's going to be the hardest part for me is to see the immature, very, very silly man that I once was. <laughs> well, and let me ask this question. How much does intentionality play in our accruing karma or creating these negative things? You know, because, like, so let's say something happened, but, you know, there wasn't any intention behind it. Um, you know, it happened on as, you know, as an accident. That might not even be a good example. But there's not an intention behind it. Is that 
but the person is affected. You know, you're in a, you know, there's a dynamic between you and another person. You don't mean to hurt the person, but the person is hurt. You know, does yeah. that include karma to you? You know, how would something like that play out? Because it's not like they didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's not that easy. Um, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to, um, if you're going to be abrupt or, uh, um, you know, very, very, very uh, sharp with someone, then I think you need to. I, you need to understand that there are ramifications, even though you didn't mean to hurt them. And um, and by the way, you're hurting someone is all relative. Uh, if a little kid is in the kitchen about to touch a red hot pan on the stove and you scream at them quickly, yes, you temporarily hurt their feelings. And um, uh, but in the end, you save them from getting uh, burnt. And so it's it's a tricky question in a lot of incidences. If your intention was good and you came off sharp and abrupt, well, you know, you should have not come off so sharp and abrupt. And I'm the last guy, you know, who can talk about this because, believe me, I'm very sharp when I need to be. Um, and I wish I could be less sharp. But, um, but at the same time, you know, people do need to hear the truth. And if the truth hurts them, that's actually their problem, <laughs> not yours. So it depends on how you do it. I think if your intentionality is to help the person, then that's part of it. But if you approached it with a very sharp and abrupt manner, well, then now that's your fault. So it's really being diplomatic. It's knowing what to say in the moment. It's also knowing what not to say. Um, sometimes it just pays off just to be quiet, like a Zen master says, and don't say anything. Because sometimes you can't solve any problem. You have to let the person go all the way deep into the darkness before they can solve the problem for themselves. And I'm sure we've all been through that. And so there is, there is an intentionality behind it. Um, at the same time, if you're being nice to someone just to get their money, then you're not really being nice. Your intentionality betrays the uh, apparent altruism and it's really um, just altruism disguised as greed, or greed disguised as altruism. So, yeah, I mean, you got to be careful in both ways. You can't just pretend to be nice to people uh, because you're trying to get something from them. That, that's bad karma, too. So your intentionality plays a big, huge role in this whole thing. And uh, I've actually reached the conclusion that possibly it's better to not have any intentions about anything. Um, because even, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and, uh, and sometimes we may not know what we're, um, what we're really creating when we do, when we do things. And, you know, the Zen masters say don't do anything if you're in doubt. And that might be good advice. I don't know. I mean, my philosophy of living is I do what spirit tells me. You know, people go, well, what are you going to be doing next year or in five years? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> they haven't told me yet. And yeah. when they tell me, I can let you know because I might be working on something in the moment. And once that's done, it's kind of like, do, 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 do. Okay, ready for a new project. You know, what's, what's next? And then they no, tell I, me, I, and I, I work on that. Too. Yeah, that's what I do, too. I kind of, it's kind of the, um, I use the analogy of the, um, of, of a surfer. I used to be a, a big surfer when I was younger. And a surfer needs a certain amount of athletic talent. It's true. But what the surfer to be really successful needs is this intuitive ability to know where the wave is going and to adjust their body to that knowledge. And so I, a good surfer is not necessarily a good athlete. A good surfer is one who knows where the flow is going and positions of themselves to be in the best part of that flow. And I think that's what I try to do. Uh, I, 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 I consider the wave to be spirit, and I am me on the board in the ocean of spirit, and I'm constantly looking to see which way that wave is cresting so that I can position myself to ride on the wave with the least amount of energy expended. And, um, 
and and people that irritates a lot of people people who live this kind of life you know, other people find it very irritating because it looks like everything is coming easy to that person um and oh, oh, look, oh so easy oh you're creating all this stuff how do you do it how can you keep producing and making all the books and movies and everything and it's i can only do i can only do a tenth of what you're doing and it's like no no if you rode the wave and you just followed which way the wave was pushing instead of you trying to force the wave um you would find that life is a hell of a lot easier and so that's what i try to do and and you know people think that i'm like some I have some gift from God that allows me to produce, 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 but actually I don't really even work that hard. It just looks like I work hard. And I think that, you know, good surfers are the same thing. They don't, they're not really working that hard. They're just kind of tilting the board in the way that they see the wave coming and then let the wave do all the work. And um, I think that's really But they're the not way. trying to control the wave. You know, no. the wave is... And they get on the wave where a lot of people want to say, well, this is where I want the wave to go, and this is how I want the wave to be, and then are disappointed or they pissed are. off when that doesn't happen. That's right, and, 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 you, and you can't force a situation. And I think you know, all really good athletes know this, and, and that's why they almost achieve a kind of a mystical um, attitude about life, the really good ones. Like, like Babe Ruth used to claim that he could actually see the stitchings on the ball as it raced by him at 98 miles an hour, which seems almost unbelievable because the human eye could never really pick up that, um, you would think. But I, I think he probably could see the stitches on the ball. He probably could freeze the ball in time and space and knew exactly where to hit it. And I think when you see a great athletic performance, you're seeing this or a great artistic performance like a dance, a great dance. You're seeing that in action. But to live that outside the worlds of the art and sports, now that's a trick. That's our serious trick. And that's a trick that, you know, we should all be trying to learn. And, uh, you know, we can use the analogy of Obama again. If Obama would just kind of ride the wave instead of trying to push the wave around, I think he'd be doing a lot better. And I think his uh, move in Afghanistan is going to backfire on him because he's trying to force the wave. And you can't. You just can't force that wave. And, um, and I'm not sure there's any wave in Afghanistan that anyone can ride to uh, any It's any a desert. Of, they didn't tell you that? that? Yes, I did know that. <laughs> it's, it's not a good place to go surfing. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're going to go snow surfing, so uh, I think you know he, he 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 and he was riding that wave so well during the election. He was so perfect. He knew exactly which way to go. He never looked rancored or upset by anything. But I think since he's been in office, he's letting the wave. He's trying to push the wave around, and the wave is way too big to be pushed around. I think he needs to ride it. He needs to assure us that he's riding that wave instead of instead of the other way around. But he may be caught up in such a such a, a tumult, tumult right now that he can't even figure out where he's going, which uh, wouldn't surprise me. I just did a, uh, a a TV show with Jesse Ventura, and he told ooh, me that ooh, conspiracy he was, theory. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be on January show. 13th. Yeah, I'll be on January. Ooh, well, 13th. I'll be watching you on TV, going, I know that guy. <laughs> yeah, well, Jesse's a great guy. He told me that. Um, that when he was governor, that it's like being on the tread on a treadmill, 24 hours a day, and the treadmill's turned all the way up to 10. And you know, there's no getting off. There's you just keep going. And I think that when you're caught in that kind of situation, you kind of lose your objectivity. And I think that's what's going on with all these politicians, which is why we can't rely on politicians, because the nature of the beast kind of snuffs them out in a way as soon as they get in there. And that's why I think we have to start rejecting, rejecting the whole thing, building parallel cultures and societies, and they will follow us. And I think we're actually doing it. I think the, the 60s, the people in the 60s made a lot of mistakes, but now that they're in their late 50s and 60s, they realize their mistakes, and uh, some of us are trying to regroup, influence the young, and that's another reason why I made Infinity the Ultimate Trip, was so the young could see that um, that there's something there beyond just their little lives, which is, you know, the West just constantly wants you to believe 
that all there is is this one life, there's nothing else, and uh, you got to just grab everything you can now. And it's not true. And you don't want to grab everything that you can now because you may be creating a really crappy life review when you die. And you don't want that. You really don't want that. Well, I think that, you know, there's a certain level of, you know, the energy of entitlement with young people today and that whole disposable society. It's like, well, you know, I I had my uh, iPhone or whatever and I dropped it on the, I threw it to my friend across the room and it broke. Aren't you going to buy me a new one? Like, no. But there are a lot of parents that would say, oh, little Johnny, you broke your $500 iPhone. Okay, this weekend we're going to go get a new one. I mean, I'm yeah. not making this up. Well, I know you're not. I, you know, I'm astonished by what I'm seeing out there. And that's another thing. This over coddling of of young people, it's really got to stop. I mean, you're just these people are just destroying their children. And um, personally, I uh, we we raised uh, our son, and there was no TV allowed in the house. No, um, no, uh, bitty, no computers. He couldn't use computers. Nothing. Everything, everything had to be drawn out by hand. Uh, we insisted that that everything be be written down in handwriting, and um, and everybody said, "Oh, you're crippling him. He's when he gets into the world, he's not going to know how to do anything." And I was like, "Oh crap, that's not true." Within one year out of getting out of high school, he was as computer literate in college as anybody else. So uh, these people would think that, that uh, but on, on top of all that, he had learned how to read, he had read every night instead of watching TV, and he uh, had a full life before being caught up in the, in, in the material world. And I, I, I actually, I say that's what everyone should do, just pull the plug on all of that crap with your kids. Read to your children, take walks in the woods, grow a garden, Learn how to do things with them, but my God, don't waste your children's life by giving them video games and watching TV and and all of that. You might as well just give up. You, you talk about having a very, very bad life review. If you're doing that to your kids, you're going to live through the hell that they that they're going to live through because you made them so dysfunctional. Um, so you know, you may have a temporary. Um, peace because they're caught in front of the television and not screaming and yelling and causing you pain but in the end you're going to pay dearly for not helping those kids function in this world in a real way and um, I don't know I see these kids and I just don't know what's going to happen next I really don't well I mean the other day my son was going on a job interview and he texted me and he goes polo shirt or shirt with tie and I said well shirt with tie kind of based on the position and I said but not wrinkled and so he texted me back and he goes well it's a good thing you taught me how to iron and it's like <laughs> <laughs> but you know you don't think about it but a 20 year old boy these days probably doesn't know how take it out no, of the dryer shake it out no, they don't. Um, they don't, and uh, um, it, it's. Uh, I don't know. I, at this point, it, it's going to have to get radical, or we're going to we're going to lose these kids. And I, you know, I hate to say this because I don't. I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but I have to say. But you're going to be on that show. Well, I know, but it does look like it's by design. It doesn't look like it's an accident. It looks like they're being retarded socially retarded and it's being done on purpose and that, that's my conclusion and my brother is a um a high up in a school system somewhere in this country and he told me that he that he's been watching for 30 years the intentional dumbing down of students the 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 math books are getting more and more stupid until it used to be you had to know some rudimentary algebra by the time you were a sophomore now you don't even have to have it when you're a senior um they said they threw out diagramming sentences he said no one knows how to speak anymore they're not they said what they're doing is they're they're not teaching them how to think they're teaching them what to think 
And I think that is almost criminal. I really do. And I may decry the Catholics, um, but I'll tell you what, I was raised in a Catholic school system, and those nuns did teach me how to think. And, uh, um, and I think that's a difference. I don't think even the Catholics are teaching this anymore. So I think they've all abandoned this kind of uh, attitude of, of how to cr- uh, critically review a subject, how to analyze it, how to break it down, how to um, put it back together, how to uh, find out what is wrong with it, how to find out what is right with it. I think all these things are disappearing, and in that is going to be a lot of very, very, very bad things. However, I want to clear one thing up. There are groups like the Wilderness Youth Groups out of California. These guys are taking kids, and God knows how long it will be before they get sued. They're taking kids out into the wilderness for two weeks without anything, no jackets, no, no heavy clothing, no knives, nothing. You, they simply show up at a place and they go out into the wilderness for two weeks and they come back and they know how to build campfires without matches. They know how to hunt. They know how to get all the indigenous food in the area. They know how to build shelters. And these are 12-year-old kids, and I've seen them. And they come back completely altered, completely changed from the spoiled, television-ridden kids that they were when they left on these wilderness trips to full human beings, fully awake, mature, and it happens in two weeks. So there is a lot of good stuff going on. We just can't tell the government, that's all. Well, I mean, you know, between TV and then the medication that is just passed out like candy at schools, I mean, I'm sure you've read Brave New World, Alex Huxley's Brave New World, and there's a, you know, everybody got Soma. And I'm like, TV is the Soma of the 21st century. Here, just go sit in front of that tube. Uh Uh-huh. Well, Aldous Huxley was one of them, and he wrote that because he'd seen the plans. He knew the plans. He was part of the ruling elite. And, and he tried to warn us in, in that book, as did Orwell in 1984. Uh, they're both trying to warn us about what is in the plans. So the plans are to turn us into a kind of a, a sexless uh, uh, automaton um, who is guided by television and drugs to serve the economic needs of the ruling elite, and um, I say life is better than that, and I don't want to spend my life doing that. Sexless? Woof! That would be yeah. bad. Horrible. All right, we need to take another break. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Uh, we're talking to Jay Wiedner about his movie, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip. The website is www.sacredmysteries.com, and we'll be back after these words from our sponsor. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. Hi, I'm James Alta Janchik. The Black Knight of Talk Radio. Listen to Dr. Rita's Soul Healer Moment live each third Sunday night of the month on Feet to the Fire www.feet2fire.com for more information. You can get a copy of Dr. Rita's latest book, Avoiding the Cosmic 2x4, by visiting www.soulhealer.com. Get your copy today. How would you like to live long and enjoy great health? How about creating solid bones and whiter teeth, strengthen your heart and eyes, and have radiant, youthful-looking skin? There is an ancient health and longevity secret that has been used for millennia in Egypt, India, and China that can help you achieve this. For the first time in the modern world, Pearlseum brings ancient wellness secrets to you. For more information about Pearlseum, visit www.ancientpearl.com. Are you sensitive to energy? Want to explore the world beyond the five senses? Looking for a new career as an alternative health care practitioner? Then the Institute of Applied Energetics, Medical Intuition, and Energy Medicine Training Programs 
may be right for you. Our comprehensive curriculum provides students with a deep understanding of how to detect, evaluate, and transform the subtle body, as well as techniques for correcting energetic imbalances that may underscore a person's ability to experience radiant health. So if you are sensitive to energy, contact the Institute of Applied Energetics right away. Be a catalyst for changing the way healthcare is done around the world. Visit www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com and start your new career today. And now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm Dr. Rita Louise and we're talking to Jay Wheatner about his movie, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip. His website is www.sacredmysteries.com. So, Jay, there was a question and actually a little dialogue going on in the chat room, which I think is a good place for us to go. Um, So the question is, is how would we create an opening to consider change? And then someone uh, posted this comment, is this like taking a personal responsibility revolution? Is that what you're suggesting, a personal responsibility revolution? Heaven forbid. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what well, I Well, her comment was, I love it. So, but I told her that I would, I said that I would find out. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that what we've done is the exact opposite of that. We've let everybody make the decisions for us. And we know that the decisions that are being made for us are really bad decisions. And we're still letting them do it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm saying that maybe our new favorite word should be no. You know? They say something, we say, no. No, we're not doing that. No, 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 no. Sorry. Sorry, nice try. Go back and come up with something else because we're not doing that one. And we need to all just say no. We just say no, we're not doing it. And, uh, uh, and they're going to get very frustrated and they're going to go away. And, uh, but if we don't, start saying no to them and start saying yes to what we think is the right thing, which is very likely the right thing, we're going to be in huge trouble. And so far we're not doing it. And I'm really trying to show people that first off, you're not going to die. They're not going to kill you because you stood up to them. In fact, if anything, they're going to scurry like rats when you turn on the light in the kitchen. And um, uh, uh, nature loves courage and removes barriers to the courageous, for the courageous. And I can only say that um, I used to be afraid of everything, and I decided about 20, 25 years ago that I wasn't going to shut up anymore. I was going to start saying exactly what it is that I feel about what I see going on, and everyone told me that I was going to get killed by the government and they're going to put me in a concentration camp and just shut up and just do my bit and, and everything. And I found exactly the opposite. As soon as I started saying it, people started clamoring to hear more. They, they, they weren't, and no one threatened me. I've never been threatened by anybody. Um, I think they're actually, if they're anything, they're actually intrigued by there's somebody actually saying something um, uh, outside of their purview. So I, I, don't, I don't buy the whole thing of, of, of the government as this big, huge uh, watchdog. I think the government doesn't even know what's going on, and, 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 and they're, they're more confused than we are. That's what I'm trying to say. We know intrinsically what to do. We know exactly what to do. We need to do it. We need to just do it. We need to do it without seeking the approval of friends and family and the media and politicians. We need to just get some courage, bite the big one, and go do it. And we've got to do it now. And you're not going to die. You're going to have to come back here. It's not, nothing is going to be as easy as dying to get out of here. So you need to get over the fact that you're going to die and get out of here because it ain't going to happen. You're going to come right back in. Whatever world you're leaving behind is exactly the world that you're going to have to face again. And so you need to start making this world. You're never going to make this world perfect. 
but my God, we can make it better than it is right now. And um, we need to reject everything that they do. They're everything. They're, we don't want any of it. We don't want their money. We don't want their medical system. We don't want anything from them. If you fall into the trap of saying, oh, well, they're going to give me health care, they're not going to give you health care. They've never told you the truth ever in your entire life. Why are you going to believe them now? It's ridiculous. And, and, and the health care is, they're going to outlaw alternative health care. At first you're going to think, oh, it's all right. But then pretty soon they're going to say, oh, if you teach yoga, you're going to need a four-year degree from a yoga college. If you teach Tai Chi, you need a four-year degree. You're going to need, uh, they're going to come in, they're going to over-regulate the entire system and um, destroy all the good things that are in it right now. I can go down and get, you know, my, my, my health care uh, takes care of uh, acupuncture and massage and all sorts of things. That's all going to disappear. And it's going to be just pharmaceutically based. So forget any kind of hope that they're going to come from without. It comes from you. It comes from inside you. You already know what to do. Now, go but do you know, it. And the part that's so scary about that one piece, you know, because I do alternative health stuff. I mean, that's I'm a naturopath and a medical intuitive. I mean, that's well, you're gonna be most of my business. You're and, gonna be I, of you know, and, and no kidding. But yeah, it's not yeah. just me. It's not, you know, there's, there's me. I mean, that would, that would really suck. But there's everyone else that does that kind of work. There are the massage therapists. But then you sit there and you take it upstream. There are the people that sell herbal supplements. There are the companies that manufacture herbal supplements or manufacture massage tables. And there is the, it's a whole industry. I had gone to a lecture. I mean, this had to have been 12 years ago on alternative health. And I thought it was kind of like a, about alternative health. And it was a bunch of doctors sitting around a room. I mean, it was a conference room, you know, so it wasn't like three guys sitting at a table. And they put up this one slide that I, I don't remember what the conference was about other than this one slide. And they put up a, buy, a pie chart, and they said, this is how much money is spent on alternative health based on the full amount of money spent on health care. And it was a maybe... Uh, an eighth of the pie, you know, so it wasn't a huge piece of the pie, but it was a significant piece of the pie. And then the turnaround comment was, and all of that is paid for out of pocket. And I was like, oh, so you just want people to have to pay for, pay you out of pocket because you're going to get more money as opposed to dealing with the insurance companies. And not much yeah. after that, you know, like Johnson & Johnson came out with their little herbal aspirins and herbal this and that. And it's like, oh, you all want to get in on that alternative market because people will pay out of pocket because they don't want to use the system. Uh, that's right, and 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 that is that's a really good point. And this, I mean, I know, I know naturopaths that will not use the system anymore because they're just overwhelmed by the amount of paperwork that the insurance companies are are, are forcing on them, and so they're just telling their patients that they're not going to even accept it. And and this is this is this is not going to get any better under a national health insurance plan. It's going to get worse. They're going to outlaw people like you. At first, it's going to look like it's all great, and then everybody. But but after a few years, you're going to slowly see this kind of destruction of the entire um, the entire alternative uh, health system. And the reason this is is because the people that are making this new healthcare system are the pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> That's who, who's who's designing it. It's the healthcare companies. You, you think that you think that the, the Democrats are going to pass a bill where you're going to get fined three thousand dollars for not having health insurance? Who do you think's behind that? It's the health insurance companies that are behind it. They want you to get their crappy health insurance, and they want to force you into it. And um, so this this thing is just you know it's not going to work. And every time we rely on some kind of central authority to give us something, all they do is take it away. And that's what's going to happen here. And I'm not even getting in to the idea that they're going to add 40 million people by their own figures to the health rolls 
because there's 40 million people who are supposedly are not without, without insurance right now, but they're not adding any doctors. So you're going to add 40 million people onto the health care rolls without adding any doctors. I'm sorry. There's only one word to explain what's going to happen there. It's going to be rationed. You're going to call your doctor. The doctors up. don't want to participate in this. They don't. Of course not. Who would want to participate in that nightmare? And uh, uh, so I don't know. You know, um, I, uh, it's a trick. The whole thing is a dirty, rotten trick. I hate to say it. And 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 the Democrats, um, you know, they're telling us that they're doing it for us. But if you examine the bill, and by the way, they're passing legislation right now that says that they don't want to post any more bills on the internet. You know why they're doing that? Huh? Yeah. They're, that, that, Excuse they're, me. Yes, they're they're passing legislation right now. It's up. I forget who. I was uh, Waxman. Henry Waxman is putting it up. The FDA uh, inside guy in in Congress uh, that the that the Senate and the Congress no longer have to put bills up on the internet to be read by us before they're passed. Now this happened because the people read the original health bill and started protesting at the town hall hearings, mm-hmm. and everyone said, "Oh, they're stupid. They never. They don't know what they're talking about." Well, I'm sorry. No, you're wrong. The people that were protesting are the ones who read the bill. I read the bill. It scared the living daylights out of me. And anyone who thinks that, you know, <laughs> that that bill is a good bill is out of their mind. And you, and you will regret it when it's passed. And apparently it's going to pass either today or tomorrow. Yeah, but which one are you talking about? You know, yeah, the one where you have happen. jail time, no jail time, you know, death committees. I mean, you know, I, I just hear these horror stories, but it's, it seems like there's multiple versions, and they're going to oh, fight right. over, you know, which version is the less awful of the awful versions, and that's the one they're going to pick, maybe. But, you know, throw in a couple of, you know, uh, what are those little extra bills? Uh, oh, um, yeah, earmarks. Earmarks. I, I kept well, thinking pig earmarks things. earmarks for sure, yeah. No, that, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. And, and again, we fell into a trap where we thought that we had a Messiah who was going to save us. And now we know, well, if, you, if you've read the bills, the bills that, that are out there, the various bills, we now know from anyone who's read them that this is um, much worse than what we have right now. And um, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, I'm even thinking of leaving the country because I don't really want to be involved in a health care system that is so horrible. And I uh, just don't. I mean, if I, want, if I have enough money to pay for something and I decide to do it, I want to be able to do it. And I don't think I want anyone to tell me that I can't do it, and not, not because of my age or my economic worth or any of it. And um, so I, I think that's actually the health care bill is going to be the spark that triggers the um, foment for a gigantic shift and change, which I predict will come somewhere between now and 2016, probably right around 2012 is when it's going to happen. And it's going to be momentous, and it's going to be a great thing. I'm very optimistic about it. And uh, I don't want people to think I'm not because I'm, I'm, I'm horrified at this health care bill, which I am, um, as anyone who really cares about health care should be, because it isn't about health care. It's about power. It's a power grab. It has nothing to do with health care. As you well know, if you're, a, if you're a, an alternative physician, a naturopath, then you already know what I'm telling mm-hmm. you. And I've been telling all my friends who are naturopaths that they're going to be out of business, and they all know it. It's amazing. They're like, I know, I'm going to be put out of business. And I, I just think that, you know, we need to tell people in the new age who think that this is a great thing that maybe it isn't such a good thing and maybe we need to to back off a little bit, reexamine the whole thing, and uh, come back later with a different plan. Well, I mean, you know, there's supposed to be the provision where if you don't buy, don't have health insurance, you're going to be forced to buy it or be yep. fined or go to jail. And then it was... I know. And then it was estimated that for like a family of four, it would cost around $12,000 a year to provide coverage. Okay, so let's even just cut that in half. Let's say $6,000 a year. So if you're working at McDonald's and and you got a family and you're working three jobs, you don't got that kind of money. 
to buy insurance. I mean, you're lucky that you can put food on the table and gas in the car. Uh, exactly. And I don't know anybody that's been to the supermarket lately. You know, no inflation except the $100 shopping bill turned into $250 in the last few months, and there's nothing in your heart. No. In fact, I spent $35 yesterday, and I had uh, packed everything into one of the smallest bag that they had at the store. <laughs> A little tiny bag at $35 worth of food in it. I was like, my God, I'm going to eat this in five minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is what's going on. The shift is, it's a catastrophic shift, and the politicians are running around telling us they're taking care of business, but they're not, and um, all the things that they're offering are just going to make it worse. You know, the Tao Te Ching, which is really my favorite book, um, it says that, you know, those who make laws, uh, those who make more laws only create more outlaws. And I, and I really believe that. I really believe that this constant trying to force a situation is just making everything worse. And we need to quit forcing. It's the surfing analogy again. We keep trying to make the wave do what we want it to do instead of just following the wave. And I, it just, it's got disaster written all over it because the hubris of the human mind, especially the Western human mind, thinks that it can control everything. And it can't. It's just an illusion. And in and, and that reality, the, the virtual reality of the economy and everything that, that they've set up is all collapsing in front of us, right in front of our face. And um, some people are saying, oh, it's horrible, it's horrible. I say, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jay, we have about uh, nine minutes, eight, nine minutes left. Do you have any last words for <laughs> the listeners? Well, I mean, you know, I think we have to, uh, we have to, um, like I said before, we have to reject their world and we have to start building a new world. And I really can't can't emphasize enough that I think people really need to to begin to create their own communities, their own food sources, their own. Make sure you have a clean water supply. Um, buy Sacred Mysteries DVDs and take them with you so that when you're out in the middle of with your community, you can watch high-quality DVDs over and over again like Infinity, The Ultimate Trip, and also our new Qigong series, and all of them. And, and, and bring books with you that you're going to need, like How to Grow Food and How to Can, and uh, maybe pick up a musical instrument and learn how to play. That's going to become very useful. And also, you know, the skills that we think that we need in this world are not going to be very useful in that world. So if you're going to um, college or you're sending your kids to college and they're getting a degree in business administration or in marketing or in advertising or media, they're probably not going to have a job when they get out. So, I mean... If they're, if they're going in for any kind of health care, they may be all right. But really and truly, I think, you know, kids today, they really need to learn how to, how to pound a nail and how to saw a board and how to chop firewood. Um, these are going to be the skills that are going to become very, very important as we get closer and closer to this big collapse. And, um, and meditate. Find something. To do to keep yourself calm in the middle of all this. That's all I can say, you know. Yeah, because I guess there's not going to be any, uh, you know, Prozac flying around. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, there might be if you pay your insurance, your you know, health, mandatory health insurance. Uh, <laughs> well, that's true. Um, although I, I kind of doubt it. Um, but uh, boy, getting rid of those drugs, I think that's going to be the best thing that ever happened. Uh, to us, so I, I'm kind of looking forward to that. I, I hope the drugs disappear and go away forever, <laughs> because I think they've been really bad. Uh, all of them, Prozac and all of them. I don't think they're helping anybody or anything. And um, uh, I, in fact, I have to be honest with you. I did not even realize how prevalent those drugs were until just a few years ago, when I noticed a lot of aberrant behavior among young people. And so I started asking people, you know, are you on Prozac? Are you on uh, these drugs? And guys started coming back, and 95 out of 100. 
uh, were either on them oh, or had been on them. And that, that really shocked me. That, that really shocked me because why do they need to have these behavior modification drugs? What in the world is going on that children need to take these things? And because again, they don't know how to go outside and climb a tree. They never learned. You yeah. know, they just learned how to sit in front of a computer or a TV set, and they never learned how to use their energy other than in a static place. And if you just sit all day and don't do anything to exercise your body or your mind, um, you can have issues. I can totally see that happening. I, I guess so. I just, I, you know, I grew up, and my mom and dad had to practically come out at 10 o'clock every night and beg me to come in. I mean, I would never. Why did you? <laughs> yeah, I, I just can't imagine, you know, living a life while watching TV. Uh, nothing could have been more boring to me as a kid. And um, uh, uh, so I don't know. I, I guess it is a different world, but um, I think that, our world that we grew up in is more the norm, and what they've grown up with in the last 40 years is the abnormal. And when the abnormal hits reality, um, it's not a pleasant sight, and I think that's going to happen very soon. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 can, I, I beg people with kids to get them off those drugs, get them into a wilderness youth program, get them into a spiritual discipline, Get them uh, almost in some Turn way off the school. TV. How's Turn that? Turn off the TV, yeah. Maybe even, <laughs> geez, reject the school system. I hate to sound like a total radical, but I, I reject the entire school system at this point. I, I, I don't think that they're teaching anything worth a damn, honestly. I think I can teach math better than any school teacher that my son ever had. And, um, and so I think also the Internet's going to make that possible, too, so we're going to be able to find alternative ways to educate and uh, um, it's all going to collapse and uh, and it's a good thing I know it sounds pessimistic but it isn't it's a positive thing and I'm for it and I'm doing everything I can to encourage the collapse and the rebuilding because if you have a collapse but you don't have an alternative then what good are you and so we need to begin creating the alternative which is why I do shows like this because I want to I want there to be a dialogue starting now as to what it is we're doing and where we're going. And I, I actually believe it is starting because I'm seeing it showing up um, various places where it shouldn't show up. Uh, so the message is getting out very, very slowly, but it is getting out. That's good. So uh, I'm like going, well, I'll ask, oh, up, oh, up. Oh. I think we just... Uh, Lost Jay. His number dropped off. Jay, are you there? Well, we lost Jay, but we only have a couple of minutes left, and we actually have a very interesting show coming up next week. But wasn't that a fascinating uh, show today? God, there's just so much to think about, and you, you think about what's going on in our, on our planet and in our country. It's just kind of overwhelming. And Jay was saying that in January, I'm going to give this a plug, in January he was going to be on Conspiracy Theory with uh, Jesse Ventura. And I've watched the show a couple of times. It's actually one of those, you know, I'm big on TiVo. Um, you know, and if there's something that looks interesting, I'll tape it and then, you know, fast forward through all the commercials because that's the benefit of recording. But you can pick and choose what you want to watch. And that show is actually, they did 9-11 last week or this past week. And I think it's on Wednesday at 10 o'clock Eastern on True TV. Never watched that network before, but True TV. Anyway, um, next week, we actually have three guests on the show. In the first part of the show, the first half hour, we have Gary Tillery coming on, and we're going to be talking about John Lennon, a spiritual biography. Uh, Gary, um, well, not Gary, you know, John Lennon um, passed just recently, just I think last week, and so I thought it would be a fitting tribute to John Lennon and all his work and that he's done um, to have a show about him. In the second half hour, we're going to have Rulin Yu, um, and we're going to be talking about um, living happier and healthier and longer. And she is a, a doctor, native of China, and we're going to be talking about alternative health and things you can do to live a happier and healthier, longer life. 
And then in the second hour of the show, we're going to be having my good friend Jerry Pippen and his friend Robert Miles coming on, and we're going to talk about Roswell, Revelations, and beyond. They have, Jerry has been working in the UFO community uh, for over 40 years, and they are working on a new movie called Roswell Revelations. And so we're going to find out what's going on with Jerry and Robert and kind of hang out with them for a while. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. They're very cool people. Anyway, that's the show for today. Thank you all for tuning in. If you um, enjoyed the programming today, please do mark the show as a favorite. I'd really appreciate it. And so from me, Dr. Rita Louise, and Just Energy Radio, have a great weekend. And until next time, be blessed.